Yeah, I was living in a foster home, dropped out of high school, and rec- all I knew is I needed a kick in the ass, and I figured, well, the Marines, they'll definitely do that, and uh, they did not disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in fo- you were in foster homes from what age? Uh, that was maybe I joined when I was 17, I guess 15. My parents divorced when I was young, and I bounced around, and then— you know, a lot of this was my own doing, you know, to be perfectly honest with you. I was, you know, sort of done with my parents and wanted to, you know, they had moved from Lake Stevens. And I was like, hey, I'm not I'm not doing that with all the wisdom that a 15 year old possesses, you know. And so, uh, this, so, so this is what, 19, like 75? Uh, yeah. If you want to round up a couple of years, that'd be fine, too. But uh, <laughs> but I'm saying it's 1975. Yeah. You're 15 years old. You're living in foster homes. You're like to hell with the parents. I'm doing my own thing. What? Did you have any, uh, did you think, <laughs> were you just, just short-sighted, not? Well, it was, you know, actually it was a little later than that. My mother was a writer. She passed away last year, uh, December, a year ago, last December. And she was in South Africa. If you ever saw that movie Cry Freedom with Denzel Washington, it was about this guy, Donald Woods, who was the editor of a newspaper over there, which was on the coast of uh, South Africa. She worked for him. So I lost that whole year over there with her. And in early 76, I came back because the school didn't count, right? The oh, US. so you went there. You went to South Africa. Oh, yeah. Africa. I lived in East London, South Africa, between Durban and Cape Town. And that was a little slice of the Marine Corps right there. I mean, uniforms, haircuts, and school and the whole deal, which, you know, I did not adjust well to that, <laughs> by the way. And it received the caning, numerous canings for that. Uh, oh, they got their corporal punishment. On oh, them. yeah, bamboo canes. I mean, and once in a wet speedo for not counting off properly and mandatory PT. And, uh, you know, I got religion pretty quick. <laughs> Learned how to count for sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and that's came like back. prime apartheid time, 1976. It was, yeah. And this, was, this newspaper was obviously against apartheid. So... You know, we were right in the middle of all that. I mean, it was really stark seeing the way they, the way life was over there. So anyway, I came back from that. I'd lost a year in high school, and I'm like, well, you know, look, I wasn't, you know, an ad- academic champion anyway. So <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to join the Marines. And I, my, and my, I, that's, and I got back from there. Didn't want to move back where my dad was. I was living with a guy, and then a foster home took me in. It was that. It's a pretty cool story. He, this family, the Williams family, I'm still in very close touch with them. Their son had died. He was a motocross racing is big up there for teenagers. And he had died. He was my classmate, Jeff Williams, and he had died in a motorcycle crash. And so I knew the family from afar, not not close. I wasn't close friends with Jeff, but but we knew each other. And so then it was sort of fortuitous, you know, that I providence that I came in his same age and ended up mm-hmm. with this family. And her the father, Je- uh, Charlie Williams, uh, was a former Marine from Korea. Uh, and so he was telling me about the Marine Corps, and I said, oh, that's what I need. So signed up and shipped out to the warm embrace of the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> so that did, did, what did he do in Korea? Did you capture some of those stories? Did, he was in Korea. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, he, you know, he was, I think he was a combat engineer. And, uh, you know, so he was, you know, I mean, I don't remember a lot of them, but, you know, he talked a lot about combat and how, you know, bad it's like, but really the best stories for him were boot camp. You know, they pulled all of it. I never forget one. He said they pulled all of his teeth out and were giving him dentures, you know, when he's in boot camp, right? So obviously dental care was not high on his priority list. And right after he had that, he had stitches in his mouth. And the drill instructor pulled his dog tags, pulled him towards him real fast, and then extended his fist and punched him in the mouth, and his whole you know mouth exploded with blood and everything else. And I are was we like, supposed to be laughing at this? Yeah, I was like, that hey, sounds like fun. I think I'll join. You know, so uh, I mean, those were most of his stories were the trauma. You know, when I look at Full Metal Jacket and those mm-hmm. boot camp scenes, I mean, my di said a lot of those same phrases that they were I mean I thought that was authentic what was that guy who ended up being an actor oh, Gunny. Lee Ermey. Yeah, yeah 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 he was you know the yeah, I guess at first he was a technical guy but mm-hmm. then he ended up playing a part and I was like that dude could have been Staff Sergeant Amarine who was my senior <laughs> DI when I went through so so you showed up there in 1978 so these January, guys are, yeah you're still getting you're still getting Vietnam guys oh, that yeah. are your drill instructors yeah, my company, you know, in the Marine Corps, in a company, you have a first sergeant, you know, and in the NCO ranks, you can sort of split at E8. You can either be a master sergeant or a first sergeant. 
and in a company, you traditionally have a first sergeant who sort of runs all the admin and all that. Then you have a master sergeant who does ops, right? He's like the ops sergeant. And I remember my first ops sergeant. I mean, he had one eye from Vietnam, and he was illiterate. I mean, he would sign like an X on the duty <laughs> roster and stuff like that. I was, you know, I mean, yeah, there was some. It was definitely a lot of Vietnam era guys there. And how do you adapt? Um, candidly, poorly at first. You know, I mean, uh, when I got there, you know, I mean, it was shock and awe. Uh, and I, you know, I certainly didn't want to be there. And for probably the first few weeks, thought I had made a monumental <laughs> error in judgment. But there was just enough in me that I felt like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go back to my family hat in hand with my tail between my legs. So I just, you know, tried to do it day at a time. But I do remember, you know, the first morning they wake you up, it's brutal, right? Trash cans thrown over, pulling people out of bunks. And, you know, there was a lot of physical abuse back then. I mean, it was, you know, measured, but seemed pretty violent to me. Um, but, you know, I remember laying in a, in my rack every morning before, you know, because I could hear them moving around like little mice positioning themselves before they <laughs> launched the all-out assault. And, uh, you know, and I'd be laying there and I'd be like, well, what do I have to look forward to today? Well, that would be nothing. <laughs> so once I got out of the rack and I started going, you're like, I'm muscle memory. I was fine. But those were the worst parts was that morning laying there knowing this onslaught that was going to, you know, start there in a couple minutes. But all that being said, you know, I mean, and I and I think I was sort of a jack wagon for my first come as typical, you know, I did well in boot camp. I got whatever meritorious PFC and all that. I think primarily because my drill instructor was hot for my sister. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I could take any leg up I could get. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the first couple of years I did all this. Stu- I went to Lejeune to second Mar Div out there, and I did all the stupid stuff that young troops did, you know, blow all my money the uh, first three days after payday. You know, thank God I had a meal card or I would have starved to death. Um but then, you know, the, I went to Okinawa to third Mar Div, and uh, that's when the, sort of the light came on. And I started going to school. I got my diploma and started going to college. And, I mean, you know, and then once you get a little success, you know, you sort of build on that. I mean, there are setbacks along mm-hmm. the way. But then I was like, okay, I can do this, you know. What was your MOS? I was an 1833 Amtracker. Get some. Yeah. When you, when you say, was there anything that made you realize, hey, I need to kind of step up my game. Maybe I should start, you know, going to college. Maybe I should start my continuing education. Maybe I should start trying to get advanced. Was there anything that, in particular, did you have a leader that mentored you? Did you just look around and say, man, why don't I do a little bit better? Well, do you remember what that was? Was it thing, one thing in yeah, particular? Yeah, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a specific leader. There were later in my life, certainly those that, you know, that really inspired me to go above and beyond. Um, but at that stage, I think it was more seeing people crash and burn around me. You know, I mean, getting guys getting kicked out for drugs was rampant back then. I mean, it was really ramp. I mean, and uh, and guys were getting caught. We didn't do urinalysis or anything like that. I mean, they were just physically caught with, you know, drugs in the barracks. And it was open bays back then. We were open bay barracks at Courthouse Bay, which is where our, our battalion was. And I just saw these guys, and I mean, I, I just saw them failing. And I mean, I knew they were on a downward spiral. And I think over time, I saw enough of that where I was like, okay, I don't want that to be me. And I went to Okinawa with sort of an, an, you know, a, my own personal mandate to, to turn my life around and, you know, make something of myself. Hey, you know, listen, it was never part of the training on the training calendar for me to be a general officer. I remain amazed of the flaws in the promotion system to this day. <laughs> but... You know, I just, I just, my goal was to be a sergeant, frankly. That was my goal. And, uh, and, you know, but, you know, you get a little victory and you sort of build on that. And, you know, and then lo and behold, here I am, you know, <laughs> well, flag flying and everything. So, you know, <laughs> as you know, as a former aide, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> when you, 